Okay, um, my name is John O'Hearn, and I've been practicing um, in this area of law for uh, uh, more than 20 years. And uh, I practice primarily in London, uh, but in my previous lives, I spent eight years in house at a firm called Merrill Lynch, as it then was. Um, and I practiced overseas as well in Asia, where I spent six years in Singapore, and in the Middle East, where I spent two years. So over the years, um, I've seen a lot of divergence in regulatory attitude um, internationally. Um, but what constant is that the industry tends to be pretty consistently the same throughout the world, no matter where you go. Sometimes the products vary, sometimes the services vary, um, as uh, might be required by the exigencies of the local market. But broadly speaking, the industry is more consistently the same globally than the regulatory policy or the regulatory attitude. Now, I think that's an important thing to bear in mind because it helps to explain why a similar product or service is looked upon very differently depending on the jurisdiction that we're talking about. In the time since I started out, it used to be, as my father used to say, and perhaps we should stop the camera for this bit, he used to say to me, the only reason that you ever get yourself a stockbroker is so that you can get the benefit of inside information. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. So how times have changed uh, over the years. Uh, the regulators, uh, for the past, I would say, 20 years or so, certainly the past 15, are very focused on market integrity, number one, and consumer protection, number two. And number three, the stability of the financial system, which came much more to the fore after the financial crisis of 07 and 08. So we always knew that MIFID was going to be reviewed because it said so at the outset. Um, but my, what a review it has been. What we have seen, and you'll have heard over the last day or so, um, the enormous amount of information that now must be disclosed to clients in the course of carrying on investment activity, uh, the huge range of reporting requirements that are imposed on firms, um, not least uh, in terms of how they deal with clients, but also static information and data that needs to be reported to trade repositories and other repositories has really mushroomed uh, in the wake of the financial crisis, to the extent, indeed, that even ESMA worried whether it was ready for implementation of MIFID II. Um, this bubbling or mushrooming of requirements uh, is no less felt anywhere than it is in the direct face-to-face -face with customers, primarily uh, retail investors, but more and more professional investors as well. So the purpose of my talk uh, today is to speak to you about some of the touch points on the compliance obligations that arise uh, at the point of sale under the new MIFID regime. Um, MIFID, as you know, is an extremely broad subject. I mean, we could spend far more than two days talking about MIFID in the whole. Indeed, we could spend far more than two days just talking about any particular aspect of MIFID. Um, and so, uh, by necessity, my comments are just a reduction of the main points that I think that ought to be borne in mind when you're looking at how you deal with the requirements of MIFID as regard interaction with uh, customers in the context of the provision of investment services. Um, one area that I'm going to start with is the area of investment advice. And for the most part, unless I say otherwise, you could probably roll up portfolio management into the same category here, at least insofar as the requirements um, of MIFID II that I'm going to talk about apply. And as you see from the first slide, as early as the recitals of MIFID II, there's a fair concentration uh, uh, on investment advice, and I think a significant disclosure of the European policy agenda with regard to investment advice, again, um, in the wake primarily of the financial crisis. So for one thing, we see recital 70 talks about the increasing complexity of services and instruments requiring an enhancement of the conduct of business obligations in order to strengthen the protection of investors. Where did that come from, I wonder? Well, undoubtedly, it came from the enormous complexity of instruments that were distributed pre-financial crisis, primarily packaged instruments which arose from or had their nascence in. Uh, collateralized debt obligations or other securitized vehicles. So we had 
bonds, then CLOs, CLOs squared, CDOs, and a whole host of other instruments that were uh, thrust into the market, underpinning uh, in value the assets that turned out to be certainly undervalued that went into lots of securitization vehicles and other structures uh, in the market prior to the crisis, lots of them to do with real estate. And of course, there was an enormous concern that the most risky tranches of a lot of these obligations uh, were distributed to municipals and pension funds um, and other investors who in turn were investing money on behalf of retail investors. So this has given rise to a great deal of discussion post-crisis and has resulted, at least in the context of the Mifid review, in a harsh look at the kind of information and protections that should be given uh, to investors in the context of investments. The next recital uh, to look at is the question of disclosure, which again, policy is revealed in recital 72 of Mifid II, uh, where uh, we hear it's appropriate to require investment firms providing investment advice to disclose the cost of the advice, and you've heard plenty about costs and charges earlier, and to clarify the basis of the advice they provide, and in particular, the range of products they consider um, in providing personal recommendations to clients, whether they provide advice on an independent basis, and whether they provide the clients with periodic assessments of suitability of the financial instruments recommended to them. And it's also appropriate to require investment firms to explain to their clients the reasons for the advice provided to them. So we're seeing a precursor of what's to come further in the directive, but also in 2016-565, or the delegated regulation, or the MIFID org regulation, whichever you prefer to refer to it as, uh, in this context. And then recital 73, the next recital, where it talks about uh, the importance of establishing conditions for the provisions of services when firms inform their clients that the service is provided on an independent basis. Now, I'm not going to dwell enormously on what this means for inducements because I know that Marcus is going to speak to you about that just after me. Um, but the distinction between independent and non-independent advice is one that we did not have under MIFID I. Um, and it now has come to the fore um, in a very significant way. And I'll speak a bit more about that um, later. So what's the big picture? The big picture in all of this is primarily consumer protection. Always remember that the most important part of the market in the eyes of regulators are consumers, um, the mass market, uh, because those um, are comprised of individuals who can ill afford uh, to take the financial risks that much larger corporations and more sophisticated clients can afford to take. So it's a very important focus of the regulators, and particularly we're seeing this uh, in the UK. Um, but the protections, as you will have heard, no doubt, yesterday uh, of Mifid II have expanded uh, beyond retail investors, at least when compared with Mifid I, and we're seeing now protections that are available to professional clients and indeed in some circumstances to ECPs that were only available to retail investors uh, under the previous uh, Mifid regime. Before I get into inducements, I think we should just pause and ask what do we mean by investment advice? And investment advice, the definition hasn't really changed uh, in Mifid II. Investment advice uh, means advice in the form of a personal recommendation on the merits of buying or selling or holding a financial instrument broadly. That's what it means. So it's a personal recommendation. Um, and what is a personal recommendation? Uh, is there a distinction uh, between um, advice in the normal course of that word and in the normal meaning of that word and investment advice. And this is an area that has been litigated upon pretty heavily, actually, in the UK. Uh, since about 2006, there is a series of cases primarily establishing a concept under English law known as pr uh, promissory, or sorry, proprietary estoppel, um, but, or contractual estoppel, rather. Uh, which is a new form of, or newish form of estoppel recognized by the courts. Uh, but those same cases, at least in two or three, uh, have dwelt on and have been required to dwell on whether or not every conversation involves the uh, transmission of investment advice. 
Um, and in two significant cases, one is Bank Lumi versus Wachner, W-A-C-H-N-E-R, which was decided in 2011, um, involved a plaintiff, Mrs. Wachner, in fact, she was a defendant in the case, but counterclaimed, uh, who had been dealing with Bank Lumi, which is a London-based bank, a subsidiary of one of the large Israeli banks, uh, trading reverse knock-in options for a long period of time. And Ms. Wachner, who was a lady of a certain age, uh, she wasn't young, um, but had previously been the CEO of a company called Warnico, uh, which was a listed company in the US, a lingerie company as I understand. Um, so she was a very experienced businesswoman. Um, she traded with the bank's sister company in the US for a long time and uh, traded very aggressively with them. And she asked them if it would be possible to make arrangements so that she could trade also outside of ours in New York. So they spoke to their affiliate, which is the, uh, the defendant, Bank Lumi UK PLC, and asked them if they could cover trading London time from 8 a.m. until 1 p.m. and then hand back the trading of the relationship to New York thereafter. So Ms. Wachner, was assigned um, a relationship manager who she never spoke to or rarely spoke to, preferring instead to talk to the trader on the desk. She had her own Bloomberg screen um, and she was very, very attuned to the movements in the market, particularly in the FX markets. And she traded these instruments, reverse knock-in options over a period of time. Sadly, uh, toward the end of 2008, uh, when the currency markets in about October went particularly volatile, uh, she found herself being on the receiving end of margin calls to the tune of 13 million US dollars. Because what she had been doing in her trading was entering into the options and then pushing out D-Day when it looked like she was going to be exercised by closing out positions and entering into a new option in order to put off what turned out to be the inevitable. Now, one of the claims, among many, that Ms. Wachner made was that the bank was negligent and that it had a duty to stop her from doing damage to herself. That was one claim. In other words, you had to stop the lemmings jumping off the cliff. Uh, the second um, claim she made was that uh, the discussions that she'd had with traders over the years while she was trading amounted to investment advice and that investment advice was not suitable for her. So that in other words, the bank had failed in its MIFID one obligation as to suitability toward her. Now she had been classified as a professional investor um, by the bank at the time. Um, as it turned out, for reasons that are not relevant here, there was a question mark over whether or not she really was in a client relationship with the London Bank, or was the London Bank merely providing a service to its US affiliate, um, so that it faced her as a counterparty rather than as a client, but in any event. Uh, on the question of investment advice, the court found that the nature of the discussions that she'd had with the traders um, were really no more than if, for want of a better word, um, desk um, banter. In other words, chit chat about what the trader felt was the state of the market, but didn't go so far as to amount to investment advice. So in other words, where a trader was saying, I don't know that I would do that if I were you, as was one of the conversations, because I think that's a big risk to take on dollar yen, let's say. Um, that conversation did not amount to a recommendation one way or the other, but rather a display of the particular trader's own view of the market. Now that's an important thing to bear in mind because there had been a court of appeal decision, higher court, um, earlier, um, which concluded the same thing in very similar circumstances. And so what may look on the face of it as though a client has been advised merits some scrutiny because at the end of the day, perhaps it is not the case that investment advice was dispensed, in which case the trade or the transaction may have resulted uh, on an execution-only basis as opposed to an advised transaction. So that's one thing I would say is important to bear in mind at the very fundamental level 
uh, in regard to investment advice to, is to understand whether or not the particular interaction amounted to advice at all. Because a lot of the conduct of business obligations that flow depend on whether or not advice has been given in the form of a personal recommendation. And this, and I'm not going to dwell on it because it will be dealt with amply by Marcus later, but one of the uh, chief uh, implications of whether or not advice is given is then to determine whether or not that advice was given on an independent basis, and if it was, uh, then there will be a ban on any form of inducement. In other words, where I advise on an independent basis, I'm prohibited from accepting or paying any commission to a third party or from, to receive it from a third party. And that applies also in the context of portfolio management. So understanding whether advice is given is an important first step in understanding the conduct of business obligations that may flow from it. Currently, and this still applies in certain circumstances, at least in the dispense, dispensing of non-independent advice, as long as <coughs> the payment or receipt of a commission <coughs> or other monetary benefit does not impair the duty to act in the best interests of the client, enhances the quality of the service that's being made available to the client, and is fully disclosed to the client, uh, then it may be permissible in certain circumstances to pay or receive um, a commission or other emolument in relation uh, to that advice. Um, and incidentally, these rules uh, were largely sponsored by the FCA in London because since the Retail Distribution Review, which took place a number of years ago, 2012, in the UK, there's been a huge emphasis on slimming down uh, the opportunity to receive payments or to make them to third parties. So to your point, yes, it may well be that in some jurisdictions it's okay to uh, pay but not to receive or vice versa. Um, okay, as I said, that was the UK. And I asked this question, do these rules, at least in the context of independent advice, ultimately mean the death of the independent financial advisor? Now, I raise this question, it's a pretty UK-centric question, but I think it's one that might be asked elsewhere in Europe. Traditionally, in the United Kingdom, um, Independent financial advisors are relatively, although not always, uh, small brokerages, houses, or providers of investment services, and typically they do not charge for their service. They don't charge you for the advice that they give you. Um, the tradition and the custom has always been, or certainly up to um, relatively recent times, uh, that they would be remunerated from the commissions they receive from product providers and product manufacturers and therefore didn't need to charge separately their client for the provision of the advice. Culturally, at least in the UK, and I don't know about elsewhere in Europe, uh, there would be a reluctance to pay for investment advice. Whilst many clients are happy to pay lawyers for legal advice, although in my experience they're not always that happy to pay, um, or accountants for auditing advice, uh, typically it would be considered unusual to be uh, faced with an invoice from an investment advisor uh, because of the way the industry has grown up over a very, very long period of time. Uh, what we've seen in the UK as a result of the RDR, which is the Retail Distribution Review, which is what informed the rules on inducements uh, for uh, independent investment advice and otherwise under MIFID II, is that there has been a consolidation in the industry and so that lots of the high street investment advisors cannot any longer stay in business because they simply do not have the volume of clients that will pay appropriate fees that will allow them to survive. So as a result, where they have a client base that might be partly worth it, they have been bought up or merged with larger providers. So for example, you'll have seen that even in the case of my old alma mater, Merrill Lynch, sold its private client or private wealth business to Julius Baer, and we've seen lots of other mergers, sales, and consolidation within the industry. So what is the net effect, then, of the MIFID rules uh, on uh, the ban or prohibition of inducements in relation to independent advice? It is this. It ultimately leads to a deprivation in the market for those who perhaps most need investment advice because they do not have 
portfolios large enough to attract the big players like the bulge bracket banks, and they may not be able to afford the kinds of fees that may be um, extracted from them by the larger banks. And they don't any longer, or certainly it's beginning to look like over a period of time they won't any longer, uh, have access to investment advice on the high street because those smaller players have been squeezed out of the market as a result of the economic impact of provisions that are in MIFID II, and that we've seen already in the UK because they arose following the retail distribution review. So there is an important consequence of the changes which on the face of it appear to be consumer protective uh, for consumers because whilst it might protect the consumer to make the kinds of costs and charges disclosures you've heard about earlier. Incidentally, I have a very small account. In fact, all my poor accounts are very small because I'm a really poor little lawyer. Um, but never mind, I struggle on. Um, I have a very small account uh, with a bank that shall remain nameless, uh, a large bulge bracket bank. And on costs and disclosures, I received, I kid you not, an 83-page document disclosing all the costs and charges of the service that is being provided to me by that bank. Now, raise your hand if you think I read it. When am I likely to read it? I'm likely to read it when I have a problem with my account because I've lost money. So what has started out as a consumer protective approach, and this is by no means uh, to be critical of the legislators or the policy makers because I think the intentions are very well founded. But in practice, you do two things. One is you contract the availability of services to those who I think most need them. And secondly, you feed the rising tide of willingness to litigate because you provide opportunity to challenge providers of investment services on the basis of a technical flaw or a technical breach in what they were required to do under the rules. Either that, or you leave open space to argue about whether or not there was adequate disclosure or adequate information to enable an informed decision on the part of the investing public. And we live in an environment in Europe where courts, certainly regulators, and no offense to anybody in the room who's with a regulatory authority, but the regulators largely take the side of consumers in disputes with financial institutions. And that's very, very logical and understandable in many ways. In my experience, the courts in England aren't as willing to side with the consumer. They will look and scrutinize the consumer, or the complainant, rather, uh, to determine whether or not it's just and reasonable to uh, punish the institution um, as a result of the losses that may arise. But nevertheless, that only happens in response to litigation, and litigation is a very expensive process, not least in terms of legal costs, but in terms of management time and human resource that's devoted to uh, litigious circumstances on the part of firms. So my view, and this is only my view, of uh, the protections that go with the provision of investment advice is that ultimately, from a practical perspective, they may have negative rather than positive consequences. So what is independent advice then? As I said, this is the first time um, that we have this distinction between independent and non-independent. So <clears throat> it is primarily um, looking at a sufficiently broad range of service providers or products and offering those products. And there must be no nexus between the provider's products or the chain of intermediation and the firm that's offering the products. So in other words, you don't just offer products from your group of companies or other firms that you have close links with. You offer products that are made available by other providers in the market as well. They're not proprietary to you. Um, the question of how broad uh, will be sufficient is an open question. If I make available funds from six product providers, um, one of which uh, is a group company, the others of which are not. Um, the one that is not will clearly not be an independent product, but the others that are, do I offer a sufficiently broad range to truly say that I'm independent? Should I be looking uh, for an expansion of the range of products in order to comfortably come within that definition? Um, there's not really a great deal of help 
um, in determining that question in the ESMA guidance um, or elsewhere in the delegated acts. Uh, I think that one must take a pragmatic and logical view. And I think broadly, where your product range is such that it's provided by third-party external product providers, then uh, I think you could say uh, that you are independent. Um, and then you live with the uh, regulatory requirements that go with that particular status. Where you are independent uh, for the most part, but then also offer products in respect of which you're not independent, so your proprietary products are those of group members, then to the extent that you hold yourself out to a client as being a provider of um, independent advice, you cannot make a recommendation of the non-independent product to your client unless you disclose and make clear that that product um, is tied to you somehow by reason of your association with the product provider or manufacturer. Uh, so again, uh, there will be an important uh, information aspect there that must be shared with the client. And again, uh, these things are often easily forgotten in practice. Um, it's possible that if you fail uh, to make that disclosure, you leave yourself vulnerable in the context of litigation or a regulatory challenge going forward. Uh, the next area I'll speak briefly on in relation to uh, compliance at the point of sale is product intervention, even though it doesn't happen, obviously, at the point of sale. Uh, but it's an important one to bear in mind uh, that there are now uh, considerable powers on the part of the regulators <coughs> um, to intervene in the distribution of products or in the distribution chain. And this arises primarily um, under uh, Delegated Regulation 2617-567. So it's RTS number three, I think, um, in, in the list of ones that were promulgated um, last year. Um, so, under the rules here, there are formal powers at both the EU and domestic level uh, to intervene and prohibit a product from being distributed or sold, um, or otherwise uh, to intervene uh, for the protection of uh, the consuming public. Um, and again, these powers, we've had them in the UK for quite some time, and they're based very much on the UK regime. So this is another aspect of MIFID II that was pretty much informed, I suspect, by the um, uh, FCA. So, so how do I go up here? Um, in order to avoid the exercise of these powers, uh, it's important that providers of products, manufacturers of products, comply primarily with Article 76 of the Delegated Regulation 565, um, and also uh, with Article 167 of MIFID and any other implementing measures that were adopted thereunder. But primarily what you're looking at is that in the approval process, first of all, there needs to be a process to approve uh, products on the part of the manufacturer. Uh, the design of the product must be appropriate to the target market, and it must be, in that context, answerable to the needs or perceived needs of the target market. You need to have adequate risk disclosures, and the product should be reviewed regularly in order to ensure that it is still appropriate for the target market. That's at the manufacturing end. Then at the distribution end, um, the distributors are obliged to ensure that they understand the product and have a knowledge of the key um, um, facets of a particular product. They need, before they recommend it, to ensure that it matches clients' needs, which is part of a suitability assessment. Um, there should be manufacturer training uh, provided to ensure that distributors uh, understand the nature of the product and the risks involved. And again, there should be a regular review of the distributing firm's distribution strategy uh, to ensure that that product is still appropriate for sale to their client base. Um, which brings me to the question of suitability, the next leg of uh, the point of sale type of um, range of issues that needs to be considered. Now, <clears throat> suitability is not new um, at all. Uh, suitability is something that has been around certainly uh, since MIFID I, and indeed, either expressly or implicitly, most regulators throughout Europe had a regime around suitability of one form or another, um, which was a pretty intuitive type of regime. Now, we've seen 
some changes um, in this area of regulation under MIFID II, largely an expansion of the suitability obligations um, under MIFID II, um, MIFIR, and under the delegated regulation. So the MIFID I position is that you obtain information about the knowledge and experience um, of your uh, client, that was financial information, investment objectives, and so on, um, in order to ensure that you're in a position to make suitable personal recommendations um, and so that the client could make suitable um, investment decisions. Um, the new regime, um, there was a carve-out on the initial regime for professional investors to a degree. Um, you could assume uh, for example, the level of knowledge in the UK, that's not an assumption you can easily make anymore. Um, you could assume uh, certain circumstances, um, lots about professional clients, which has been somewhat taken back now, so that there is a greater protection in the context of suitability for professional clients uh, than there was heretofore. In the case of retail clients, there's been an expansion of the obligations, which primarily revolve around reports and assessments and statements. Um, so before a relevant transaction is made, um, there is a requirement to provide the client with a suitability uh, report, uh, which explains the reasons why the particular transaction is suitable for the client, having regard to that client's investment objectives and so on, based very much on the information one would have uh, drawn together in the course of establishing the client uh, to begin with. Um, I think that uh, the range of obligations on firms in this context is pretty burdensome for the most part. Um, for example, um, where you are providing a suitability report, it must be done um, each time a transaction is entered into. Uh, and that, I think, requires a process to be implemented internally at investment firms to make sure uh, that there's a prompt to issue that report as and when investment uh, recommendations are being made. Um, there's also a requirement periodically to review uh, suitability, which gives rise to a number of concerns from a legal perspective, not least where you are simply undertaking to provide investment advice on an ad hoc basis, let's say, and you're agreeing that the investment advice will be suitable, uh, it's very apparent from the terms of MIFID II as to whether or not there's an ongoing obligation to revisit that advice and give further advice. Now, I think this could be an area uh, which will be attractive to litigators going forward. Um, against financial institutions. It used to be in the old days that we had two forms of discretion. There was pure discretion uh, where you uh, would uh, you know, take care of a portfolio as in manage the portfolio, or portfolio management as it's known under MIFID. Um, and then there is the concept of uh, discretionary advice where you uh, will use your discretion to get in touch with the client any time you feel that it's appropriate for the client to change an investment or to sell something or to buy something else or whatever. Now, in most brokerage firms uh, in the past, the position where you have an advisory account is that the relationship manager or whoever you deal with at that firm uh, may pick up the phone and tell you to buy or sell something or may meet with you from time to time to go over your portfolio and make recommendations about what you do. That's typically the way it works. What they typically would not do is undertake to have a follow-up call should the market change and tell you that you need to sell an investment now in order to cut your losses, for example. Um, very much the position was that you are uh, advised on a transaction by transaction basis, but that advice does not impose on the firm an obligation to continue to advise you on an ongoing basis. So you can see that where there are requirements about reviewing and reassessing the suitability of investments in the portfolio going forward, there's an implication that, and certainly the argument can be made, that the firm is under an obligation, so to speak, to look out for you 
and to look at your portfolio and then make a recommendation or engage with you um, at any point where there's a change in the market or a change in circumstances which might otherwise merit a, a change to the structure of your portfolio. Now, that's a very different scenario from the one we're used to in the context of investment advice. Normally, if I advise you to buy something, I'm not undertaking an obligation to come back later and tell you when to sell it. Um, if I advise you to sell something, it's on a standalone basis, on a transaction by transaction basis, and not in the context of some other undergoing, underlying obligation. So, where we might see uh, some activity here, I suspect, going forward, uh, particularly in the context of the retail market, which is where most of the suitability requirements anyway are laid, uh, is that clients who purchase investments but then cease to have any interaction with their advisor might nevertheless seek to hold the advisor accountable if they incur losses that could have been mitigated had the advisor instructed them to sell or advised them to sell or, or, or otherwise manage the position differently um, at some point earlier. Uh, now, I don't think that there's any change under MIFID II in terms of the wording of the legislation, uh, which expressly states that every advisory relationship involves an obligation to continue to advise. For, um, and no other reason that would in any event be a fetter on your freedom of con contract, um, a freedom that's pretty much well respected in most jurisdictions. But there is that implication that if I advise you to sell something, do I have an ongoing responsibility to monitor the position and then advise again uh, if it's in your interest to dispose of that position. So that's um, an important thing uh, about uh, suitability that should be borne in mind. Okay. Um, the other area where we've seen um, an enlargement uh, is on appropriateness. Um, so, uh, MIFID II, I say here, captures more instruments. What I mean by that is uh, MIFID II um, does not enlarge the range of instruments that uh, are non-complex, but rather enlarges the range of instruments that fall into the requirement to have an appropriateness test. So, um, under MIFID I, uh, the, we had broad uh, headings of instruments like listed shares, money market instruments, bonds, uh, securitized debt, shares, and other non-complex instruments and so on. Under MIFID II, if you're talking about listed shares or bonds, those shares or bonds need to be listed on a regulated market. So if it's on an alternative exchange or something that is not a regulated market, uh, then it will not be automatically non-complex for the purpose of the appropriateness test. Structured products are um, likewise, uh, or sorry, structured deposits likewise. Uh, the the uh, range of structured deposits that uh, will be regarded as non-complex has been significantly narrowed because if the deposit structure involves a derivative or something of that nature, then it's unlikely to automatically qualify as non-complex. So what we've seen then is an expansion of the range of circumstances in which an appropriateness test will need to be undertaken. So <clears throat> will any of this work? Um, from my point of view as a lawyer, I think that there is a lot of uh, good intention here, uh, but the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And so uh, my uh, forecast is that what the ultimate effect of these point of sale requirements insofar as investment advice and suitability and appropriateness go um, is likely to lead to a greater risk of litigation um, on the part of the industry. So that's just something to be aware of and alive to. Another area um, which I will speak in the time available, I've only got five minutes, um, that I think merits discussion is the whole question of documentation and taping. Um, documentation first. Uh, to the extent that you're required to deliver something in a durable medium under the various provisions of MIFID, um, it's very clear from, I think it's uh, recital 84 of MIFID, that if you've done that, then you don't need to separately do it uh, in a separate agreement. It's commonplace in the industry for most firms to have written terms of business or some sort of client agreement uh, with their clients, and I think it probably makes good sense. 
uh, because again, where problems arise, very often it's the terms of the written document that might save you. Um, so it's not sensible uh, not to document relationships with clients. Um, in the context of MIFID II, given the breadth of changes that you've heard about in the last day and a half, uh, it's pretty self-evident uh, that any documentation that is currently in place needs to be revisited if it hasn't already, um, because it will need to address things that were not required to be addressed uh, under MIFID I. So documentation is important. And in the context of documentation, and you see this uh, in, um, if you look between the lines of lots of regulatory requirements coming out of Europe, not just in the context of investment services, but also in banking, in alternative investment funds, in payment services, and so on, there is an underlying assumption that documents that are entered into by retail clients will be readable and will be in a form that a client can reasonably be expected to understand. So when you're dealing with the retail end of the market, it is important that your documents are aimed at somebody with the educational background and intelligence of an eight to 10 year old. And that sounds facetious, but I have seen this written down uh, in some regulatory guides. So that uh, you assume that the client knows nothing you pitch the language of the document in a way that's not full of industry jargon, uh, but rather is clear, simple, and straightforward. And the reason I say that is because one of the underlying principles of MIFID II, insofar as you communicate with clients, is that you do so in a way which was clear, fair, and not misleading. Now, that principle type of approach, in fact, it's encoded in some of the actual regulatory requirements within uh, the MIFID architecture. But nevertheless, as a principle, that gives enormous room to both regulators and courts to determine whether or not something met that standard of fair, clear, and not misleading. And if I fill a document with very complex industry jargon, uh, which many practitioners would be challenged to understand, then there's a very good risk that the court will say that I have not been living up to that standard of basic clarity and fairness. So that's what I'll say about documentation. On tape recording, I'm not sure whether there's been as much controversy elsewhere in Europe as there has been in the UK over the requirements to record conversations. Um, the uh, position on this as uh, set out um, in Article 60, uh, sorry, 76 of um, 565, um, and also alluded to in 16.7 of the directive itself in a very high-level way, is that conversations um, that are uh, dealing with own account trading or relate to client order activity uh, need to be recorded. Now, it's important to understand the limits on the wording uh, in method because to the extent that a conversation or a real-time dialogue relates to a client order, then it must relate to the reception, transmission, or execution of an order. Now, I say this only to, as a background to why there is so much controversy about this particular provision uh, in the UK. And that arose in the context of the corporate finance industry because the FCA, in one of its four consultation papers, dealt with the question of tape recording, which we've had for a long time under COBS 11 of our Conduct of Business source book. And COBS 11 applies very clearly uh, in the context of a trading room or a trading desk, so that um, any order taken must be taken over a recorded line. Um, <clears throat> that was expanded in the UK to orders taken over mobile devices. So a lot of firms had to invest in software to deal with orders taken by uh, individuals on their own mobile phones. Um, what it didn't really creep into was corporate finance in any meaningful way, because where you're doing an M&A transaction, there's no particular point, or it's very difficult to pinpoint a particular point where one client says to um, the other, that uh, I will buy your company for X amount, so do it. That just doesn't happen. But the ambiguity that surrounded the provisions of this particular consultation paper in the UK had the entire corporate finance industry in a tailspin. In fact, I had telephone calls from corporate finance houses in the US saying that if this is what 
the FCA mean, we will have to close our operation in London because there's no way we can tape every conversation involving an M&A transaction because invariably there are months and months of negotiation, long, long, long meetings with lots of people poring over share purchase agreements and so forth. So they came back to clarify uh, somewhat um, and I think now that that concern has dissipated because I think everybody's accepted that the only time that you need to tape um, or record telephone calls is where the conversation on that call involves the reception, transmission, or execution of an order, normally a market order. So in the corporate finance context, if you're building a stake, then clearly the stake building uh, must be over a recorded line because it will be with a broker. Um, if you've got an iceberg order, in other words, an order that needs to be worked in the market so that the market doesn't see all of it at once, that will be done typically through a broker and any recorded conversation, or sorry, any conversations regarding that order uh, would, need to be, um, would need to be recorded. Um, and where I'm taking an order over the phone from a client, I'm receiving it. So notwithstanding that that order gets executed elsewhere by my affiliate in Singapore or Hong Kong, um, both the conversation taking the order from the client and the conversation transmitting it, if it's not done electronically anyway, uh, would both need to be recorded. Um, the challenge that the uh, recorded conversations gives rise to is primarily a technical challenge, or a technological challenge, I should say. It's the cost of software. It's managing mobile phones. Ultimately, however, in my many years' experience of them, people who are salespeople are very much salespeople. And if they want to do something that's outside the rules, they will typically do it. And that's a risk you can only mitigate, but you're never ever going to annihilate completely uh, because of the nature of the industry. So where you have um, brokers or tradespeople or people who are otherwise involved in order transmission or execution, uh, you're never going to be able to prevent them having a mobile phone on which they'll take orders that's, gotten, that's not disclosed to you or that is otherwise outside the net of your software because they haven't told you the mobile phone number, let's say, or told you that they even have that device. So how do you cover the regulatory risk that arises as a result? And the only way to cover that is to ensure that you have adequate policies and procedures in place which require all conversations taken by your traders or your brokers um, to be done on either um, a firm-owned uh, mobile phone which is recorded or a landline um, or to the extent that it's taken on any other device, that device is disclosed to you so that you can put on the necessary software to capture it and so on. As I say, the uh, MIFID regime is enormously vast and I could stand here all day, thank God for you, I won't be, um, to talk about the many facets of it. This is just a very brief canter through the three or four points that I think are important to bear in mind in the context of direct engagement with clients at the forefront and the compliance obligations under the regime that apply in that regard. But if there are any further questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you. Ah, there's a question. <laughs>